Hello, and thanks for joining us for the Friends of the Farm lecture series. Each session is designed to deliver a small and in-depth dose of cannabis education. My name is Candace Haas, and I want to thank all of our viewers and customers for joining us from the pharmacy, the pottery, and the Natural Healing Center, as well as all of our friends joining us from around the world. Chances are the first cannabis accessory that you owned was either handmade or crafted out of tin, out of a tin can, out of an apple, clay, wood, or ceramic. And now you probably own something that was a, quite of an investment, has digital components, or you have a variety of accessories or devices for consumption. The way that we consume cannabis has changed over the years, and so have our accessories. To discuss this journey into innovation and the art of cannabis accessories, we're proud to welcome Lisa Snyder, the co-founder of Tokativity and the founder of LI Digital. I'm really excited that I got to meet Lisa just recently, this last year at MJ BizCon. Um, I've heard many things about Tokativity. And so since then, we've had a chance to host um, another previous webinar with her, um, Cannabis for Creativity. Check it out on our um, YouTube page, the Friends of the Farm Cannabis Lecture Series. It's another great webinar where we get into how cannabis helps en enhance creativity. And then today we're going to learn a little bit more about the history of cannabis accessories and how we've changed from smoking, like I said, out of tin can, out of wood and ceramic and some of the even earlier devices to the world that we now live in, which has digital devices and devices in different um, glass that we now invest thousands and thousands of dollars in. And so I'm really excited to see Lisa's presentation. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. Hello, everybody in uh, California. And I see there's some folks here from Michigan, uh, Long Beach, Baltimore, Maryland, East Coast. I'm curious about where. I'm originally from the East Coast. We've got Maureen in Denver and... Uh, <laughs> Just appreciate all you folks watching live and everybody that's watching afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're so happy to have you. I can't wait to see your presentation. So I'm going to be monitoring the chat and taking down everybody's questions. And I'll be back at the end of the presentation for some questions. Sounds great. OK, hey, everybody. Um, very stoked to be here with you today talking about discovering the art of cannabis accessories. So. I went on a entire journey preparing this for you, and I learned a lot in the process, and I'm excited to share with you what I learned. Um, first of all, just a little bit about me. Um, uh, Candace had mentioned I'm the co-founder of Tokativity, the global feminist community for active cannabis culture, and I'm also the founder of LI Digital. I am a feminist, I'm a business advisor, and a consumption advocate. I have over 25 years of digital strategy experience and project management experience. Um, I have produced over 500 interactive community events. I've done a lot of stuff in the digital. And when I'm not doing digital stuff, I love hanging out with my wife, Kat, and my puppy, Ziggy, here in Portland, Oregon. And if you don't know about Tokativity, we are a global community of plant medicine advocates that's rooted in feminism. And we work as a collective to modernize consumption culture through interactive experiences. Um, we have hosted over 350 consumption events around the globe since 2017. So let's talk about a little bit of cons uh, cannabis consumption history. This was a really interesting roller coaster ride to go on, and I'm excited to, to, to share all of this with you. Um, so the earliest evidence of cannabis smoking was really discovered in ancient tombs. Now, I'm not going to be going through the history of cannabis. You can kind of Google, you know, cannabis specifically. But a lot of this stuff goes hand in hand because the way that we consume cannabis um, does go hand in hand with the history of cannabis. So there'll be some crossover, but I won't be going through everything related to growing cannabis or anything like that. This is about consumption. So in 2016, archaeologists presented some of the earliest direct, directly dated and scientifically verified evidence of ritual cannabis smoking. And I'm going to show you one of those um, things that they found in these tombs. And uh, a, a phytochemical analysis indicated that cannabis plants were burned in wooden uh, braziers during uh, mortuary ceremonies in this uh, cemetery, which I believe is pronounced as uh, Jerzankal uh, Cemetery, which uh, was as old as 500 BCE in the eastern uh, Pamir's uh, region, which is actually near China or in China. 
And um, let's see what that kind of looks like. So 10 of these braziers were found from eight of the tombs and researchers found chemical evidence of cannabis residue on nine of them, um, which held small stones where they're apparently heated to use and burn cannabis plants. It is really cool. Um, this is a little map of where they found those, um, those stones. And it was interesting. I decided to not show the tombs themselves because I was like, oh, it's kind of gross. <laughs> but uh, you can Google it if you're really, really curious about that kind of stuff. And it's kind of fascinating. Um, I have been having a lot of fun, Maureen. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, this is approximately where it was found. And these are the different kinds of... Um, of things that they found. And the first round of testing that they did with these wooden vessels, they found CBN, which is um, an oxidative a metabolite from uh, T of THC. They also found CBD and they also found CBL, which I actually not honestly had not heard of CBL, though there's a million things we don't know about cannabis or that are still really barely being talked about. Um, this kind of brought me to learning more about earth pipes. Um, this is a member of uh, a South African tribe smoking daga, which is what they use. That's the word they use for cannabis. Um, and this was taken in 1930. Um, and so these earth pipes are, are wooden tubes um, that are used to inhale the smoke that's produced by the earth pipe. Um, and they burned the cannabis in small covered pits. This is kind of what it looks like underground. Now, why would they go and do this? Uh, not totally sure. Of course, they're just trying to figure out, figure it out for themselves. Um, but as you will find that the um, there has been a major evolution of cannabis consumption um, uh I don't know what word to use right now other than thingamajigs <laughs> that have evolved over time. Um, but this was really interesting. And this is how they smoked their hemp and their cannabis. And this is an illustration from the London News um, in the year uh, 1911. So I wasn't going to talk about hookahs, but then we do mention them um, in a little bit. And so I thought it was really important to, to talk about them because they're mostly used and they mostly were used for tobacco. But um, the first hookah in the form that we know today dates back to the 16th century India um, and a time when Indian glass manufacturing began as a result of the exporting of glass in India through the British East India Company. And during this period, like I said, smoking tobacco um, was popular. It was really popular also among noblemen in high society. And so there's a couple of hookah examples. You've probably heard of hookah lounges, or maybe you've even been to one. We used to have one here in Portland like 10 years ago, which has totally died off. And um, But it is really interesting. Some restaurants you even go to will will, will that serve um, Mediterranean food or something, sometimes they'll uh, be grandmothered in um, with uh, being able to smoke hookahs. And that's really fun. So if you smoked a hookah, let me know in the chat box if you're watching live. I'm super curious if you have hookah experience. So this brings us to chillums. You've probably heard of the word, um, but I actually didn't know what the word chillum really meant or where it came from. And so in Turkestan, ancient peoples smoked excavated ground pipes, which we just talked about. Um, and they were known locally as you're chillin', which is kind of fun because it sounds like, hey, you're chillin', um, which literally translates to place chillum. So if you think of the chillum or the, the pipe aspect, um, that's like that little part placed in the ground, place chillum. Um, that's sort of like how those those words kind of go hand in hand and um, was thought to refer directly to that earth pipe. So here's a picture of this um, guy in Turkestan smoking a chillum, uh, which he's using, which is kind of on the larger side. Um, and Maureen says Denver still has hookah lounges. How cool. Here's some examples of chillums. You know, it's essentially a hookah bowl, um, which is why we started talking with this talk about when talking about hookahs um it's it's a basically a hookah bowl adapted for handheld use and smoked without the rest of the device and the term really means um what the shape of it is so if you see a chillum out there 
in the universe, it's usually looking like that. They're usually made out of glass these days, but you might find them in other materials. Um, they used to be made of, of clay, but they can also be made of wood, stone, metal, or as I mentioned, glass. And uh, here's another example of that. They have a, table, a tapered, um, they're tapered at the end usually. Um, and, you know, it is thought to that they had originated in India. Um, but, you know, it's interesting as, as I looked back at the history of these things, sometimes they, uh, most of the time, actually, a lot of these things were very, very old. And, but they didn't have evidence of how old it was until they found these things in the ground, or if it was written in a book or on paper somewhere, or maybe on a scribe or something like that. So, you know, it's interesting. Where does history come from? It's like somebody wrote it down and says, this is what happened. So, um, and, and until we find those items, like I said, you know, we don't, we can't really verify exactly, um, what that was. Um, let me know if you can't hear me or see me. Um, my network says it's unstable. Um, so hopefully it recovers. All right, let's keep going. So, um, in Afghanistan, the local water pipe variation is still actually called a chalam. So I thought that was really interesting too. Um, this kind of brings us to pipes. So in the 1800s, Rastafarians of Rastafarianism in Jamaica and some Native American tribes began incorporating cannabis into their society through uh, meditation um, and gaining wisdom and um, doing religious ceremonies, which helped to pioneer one of their most famous ceremonial tools, the sacred pipe or the peace pipe. And there's an example of that um, with the feathers. And you've probably heard peace pipes. Maybe you've even passed a peace pipe or joked around about it. But this is actually where that word came from. And chillums themselves have also been traced back hundreds of years in these cultures and also in environments. Um, this picture on the right is actually an African woman smoking from a barrel pipe around the 19th century. So let's talk about bongs. I'm sure we all have a favorite bong. I have several of them. And But where does it really come from? So the first written words, remember I mentioned there's written words and then there's also finding stuff out there and archaeologists finding stuff. So the first written words of bong um, came from Central Asia in the 16th century. And the word bong comes from this high word, buong, which specifically referred to the bamboo bongs that were common in Central Asia. And on the right-hand side, um, there's a modern rendition of an ancient Asian bamboo buong. And buong also refers to a tube typically constructed out of bamboo used to smoke cannabis or tobacco. Um, and one theory says that the Thai word may have come from the uh, Bangam tribe in Africa, which I wouldn't be surprised because you're going to find out soon enough that um, that culture specifically, they, they've really been um, holding that uh, for, for a long time. And they were, they were bong makers and, and made bongs. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and it's also theorized that the use of water bongs was introduced during the Ming Dynasty in China, which spread via the Silk Road. And there's one Chinese empress, if you Google her empress, uh, let's see if I can try to pronounce her name, uh, Dowager Cixi, uh, or Zizi. Um, she was found buried with three of her prized bongs during the Xing Dynasty. And uh, which I thought was really interesting. And she definitely looks like a powerhouse. I almost put her in here, but I was like, I'm not going to move this little bong picture around. Uh, but you can Google her and, and it's really interesting that she was buried with her bongs. So uh, more about bongs. Ethiopians and Central Africans were actually, actually, actually the real OG bong smokers. Um, carbon dating, which is the scientific method that can accurately determine the age of organic materials as old as approximately 60,000 years has shown ancient bongs um, with cannabis compounds as early as the 1300s. And ancient folks passed uh, smoke through the water, which cools the smoke and filters out any ash that might be sucked into the lungs, 
Water also filters fine particle matter. And um, another thought that is kind of interesting is that my wife actually brought this to my attention. And maybe there's some history that I have not yet discovered about this, but it's really the one of the only things that has um, fire, air, water, and earth as the four elements in one consumption piece. So just something to think about. Um, <laughs> Candace says, bury me with my bong. Um, this is actually one of the discoveries of bongs. Archaeologists found a 24 hundred year old gold bong, which this doesn't look like a bong to me, but they're like, this is a bong. Um, I'm sure all these little pieces go together somehow, but they didn't put it together. Um, it was used for cannabis and opium. And this was found in Russia in 2015. So a lot of these, of these things that they're finding, they're recent findings, um, which I thought was really interesting. And they did some tests on these small cups and found residue of cannabis and opium coating the inside. And the use of the English word bong goes back to the year 1944. This is George Bradley McFarland, and it first appeared in a Thai English dictionary um, that was used by this guy. He was an American physician. And I did um, actually look up more information about him if you're curious or if you're like kind of a history nerd or whatever. Google any of these folks. It's really fascinating. You go down a rabbit hole of... Uh, of all kinds of things. He actually has a uh, background. I think he might be half Thai or his, his um, family was partially Thai or something like that. So I thought that was really interesting because he brought that word into our English language and, um, and they started using it starting, you know, not even a hundred years ago. So let's talk about rolling papers. Um, and, but we got to get into rolling papers before we start talking about joints. So um, in the 1600s, Spanish aristocrats smoking cigars led to the creation of the first cigarette when uh, peasants collected discarded cigarette but uh, cigar butts and rolled them using newspaper scraps. So they would, um, they would throw their cigars out and they would still have a little bit of tobacco in it. And peasants would go and collect and they would put all that tobacco into their own version of it and they'd roll it up in newspaper. So a smaller version of it. And um, recognizing that was kind of a cool business idea. Paper makers in Spain began producing clean white rolling papers, which quickly gained popularity as more enjoyable or as a more enjoyable alternative to newspapers. Because who wants to smoke a newspaper? Not me. And I don't know anybody who's uh, been so desperate enough to, to roll up a newspaper and smoke it. But hey, I'm sure there's lots of people out there that have done it. Uh, and that's kind of an OG style. Um, nowadays, rolling papers come in all kinds of types and sizes, with many companies uh, catering to the stoner crowd by offering longer versions. Um, some versions are short. Some versions are like you know, they burn for longer, etc. Everyone's kind of got their, their thing. Um, let me know in the comments if you like rolling joints. I personally would rather have someone do it for me um, <laughs> or just buy them as pre-rolls. But I know some people really, really love rolling their own joints. And I had a fun time trying to find some uh, images of old joints. And this made me think about um, going to you know, like yard sales and stuff and really actually looking for OG kind of cannabis stuff, which I'd never thought of doing before. Um, but that's kind of a fun idea, right? So let's talk about joints. Um, so joints are really a cannabis cigarette and they originated more than 200 years after the rolling paper. And in the 1950s, field workers in Mexico were observed rolling cannabis mixed with tobacco, which led to the first recorded form of a joint, which was technically known as a spliff. Um, and in the 1800s, well, the late 1800s, America saw the first commercially sold joints in the form of Grimmelt's Indian cigarettes, which I actually found an old picture of, and I think it's super, super cool. Um, and they advertise for respiratory relief, which is really interesting because I don't, I don't know if, that, if anybody's had some respiratory relief after smoking. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Different
kinds of relief can happen, but I'm curious about that. That's how they advertised it though. And so um, this became a popular uh, for recreational use during the prohibition era. Um, and the joint gained further popularity in the 60s as a symbol of counterculture and peaceful protest against the system. So um, I'm curious about, you know, as we're kind of going through this, I'm, I'm curious about what maybe your favorite um, kinds of cannabis accessories are and maybe which ones you're curious about, but you don't really lean into. You know, I'm, I'm you know, we'll get into dabbing <laughs> in a little bit. Um, you know, but, and I actually prefer either a joint. Um, I do love a good bonk. I love that clean, clean feeling. Um, and I mean, hell, any kind of cannabis accessory almost is a good one, right? Um, so this was so fascinating to me. The history of the word roach. So you've probably heard the song, La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. Um, you should Google that. Um, and I have actually a link here, um, which I can put in the chat if this will let me. Uh, oh, it's not linked here. It's a, it's in the PDF. But um, Google it. It's so interesting. There are so many different versions of this song. However, the word roach really got its name from the Mexican, from this song. Um, and it tells the story of a cockroach who can't get up because he has no marijuana to smoke. So how interesting is that, that the word roach, this cockroach doesn't have marijuana to smoke and he can't get up. So the end of a joint, when you're like trying to just get that last little bit, that last little bit, sometimes they call them roach clips. That's what you see in this picture here. Um, that's where that word comes from. It's like, you barely have anything left. And that was so fascinating to me. Um, and like, you might see some different versions of this out there, but, um, oh, I love this. Thank you for, uh, for putting that out there. Let's see. Um, I'm going to go with that. Okay. Um, so anyway, la cucaracha. <laughs> you might have to listen to that bile while you're like smoking tonight or, uh, washing dishes or something like that. And just, you'll never think of it ever the same way again. Um, <sighs> grinders. Okay. Where did these guys come from? So the herb grinder was actually invented by two guys, one guy named William Wingfield and the other guy named John Balding. And they are from Victoria, Australia. This was invented in 1905. Um, obviously we've had herbs for thousands of years and people have used it for thousands of years. Um, but you know, and as, as partly part of early cooking or medicinal treatments, et cetera. But, uh, before that people really used, um, these mortar pestles, which you see in the bottom left-hand corner to, to grind up their herbs or to, you know, into their medicine. Uh, and so they didn't have these grinders before 1905. Um, and really, actually, if you look at this picture, this is the patent for the grinder. And um, you'll notice that it's very similar to today's grinders. We really haven't changed the design of this very much in over a hundred years. So, um, how interesting is that? And, you know, this is definitely, and it was a definitely a game changer for not just um, cannabis, but tobacco, herbs, and really other plants ground for medicinal purposes. All right, I'm going to take you on a lighter journey because this definitely had its own evolution. And this is absolutely fascinating. If you see one of these things in the bottom left-hand corner at a yard sale, you got to get that because this is a classic. So in 1823, um, the, uh, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly. I, I tried to look this up beforehand so I can say it, but you know, who knows if I'm saying it right the way, the right way. Um, a Doberiner, Doberiner's lamp. Uh, it was also known as a tinderbox. Um, and it was really, really popular um, in the early 1800s. They reportedly sold over a million units in the 1820s. Um, and you might see this in old movies um, or, you know, uh, go on a little 
a Google search or a YouTube search for people using these. They might even have one. Maybe they have a, a vintage one. It's really, really fascinating. So that's really the first lighter um, that ever, ever was. The next uh, evolution of the lighter was the, um, the invention of ferrocium. And ferrocium is a synthetic alloy that produces very hot and bright sparks when struck. Uh, it was invented in 1903 by, by Australian chemist Carl Auer van Balash. Balach. <laughs> Balak. Um, and it really, really revolutionized the lighter and made creating um, necessary sparks for ignition easy. It was also very, very affordable material. And there's also people on YouTube that have these and they play with them. And this is probably also if you are into like you know, going out to the wilderness and camping and not having a lighter, just going bare bones, you can actually create sparks by using this material. So that was invented. Next up was in 2010 to 2012, the Ronson Pisto Lighter and Wonder Light. It looked kind of like this. It was a well-known classic lighter um, manufactured by Ronson in 1910. And then World War I happened and improvised lighters happened. And so it was really difficult for folks on the front line um, during World War I um, to get access to a lighter. And so they've kind of, um, it, because of uh, limited resources and supplies, and so they improvised and they created everyday tools by hand using whatever discarded items they could find. So this one was made, um, this is one of the handmade lighters fashioned from an empty bullet cartridge. And it even um, included a hold chimney cap to better protect the flame from the wind. So really, really interesting that they were able to figure out how to make a lighter from a bullet. Next up, we're kind of evolving in our lighter in the world of lighters, and this is the Ronson Banjo. Again, if you see any of these things at a yard sale or online and you're into collecting things, these are really highly valuable. Um, so Ranson, the, the creator of the pistol lighter and the wonder light, refined their design with the Banjo lighter in 1926. It was developed in New Jersey, and it was really, really a huge success um, with its simple usability and very attractive design. That looks like a sexy later to me. I'd definitely put that in my purse. <laughs> um, it was the world's first automatic pocket lighter. And Ronson Banjo required only the press of a button to generate the flame. So there's nobody who's trying to strike anything. There's no, it's just as easy as, as it possibly could be. Um, and at the time it cost $5, which I actually think is kind of a lot. I'm curious as in 1926, how much it actually was in today's dollars, but uh, mint condition versions, like uh, I mentioned before, are really worth a lot as collectibles. Um, the first Zippo. So we're familiar with Zippos and we're familiar with Bix for the most part. These are the two main lighters that we're used to. And um, in 1933, the first Zippo lighter was created by George G. Uh, Blas Blaisdell, introduced um, the world's most famous lighter. And the design of the original Zippo lighter pr uh, proved so popular that it is actually still popular today. If you're looking at this, you're probably like, wow, I know exactly what that is because that's a Zippo. And this is almost a hundred year old design, which is still relevant today. Oh, thank you. And in, in um, 1926, $5 would be $86 and 19 cents in 2023. Wow, that's really, really interesting. Um, so early Zippos are made of brass. However, during the Second World War, they were manufactured from black crackle steel due to the metal shortages. And Zippos during wartime were commonly um, in, emblazoned with unit crests and other military symbols, which is a trend which is still popular today. Here is an, another updated version of the post-war Zippo. It really became more of an art form. And um, following the Second World War, they really developed uh, into a popular fashion accessory. 
uh, with a huge variety of artistic designs and metals used. The Zippo quickly became a cultural icon and was widely used in movies, television, advertising, vintage designs um, are also very, very popular with collectors. And um, just like we know with the, both of those wars, the Zippo um, is really this emotional connection with folks who fought in the war. And so that is really still the same um, during the Vietnam War. So 1955 to 75, um, the Zippo lighter developed into a symbol of the American armed forces. And American soldiers fighting in Vietnam would often have their Zippo lighters engraved with a variety of personal mottos, slogans, icons, and individual designs. Um, there's also really popular collector's items if you ever find those around. So really interesting. Again, go search on YouTube if this is fascinating to you um, as it is to me. And so in 1962, the piezo uh, electric lighter, which a lot of us use to light our grills today was introduced in the 1960s and was developed as an alternative to fuel burning lighters. So instead of a naked flame, the mechanism here is uh, uses a small spring loaded hammer that hits a tiny piece of quartz, which is really fascinating. It's not creating um, fuel, you know, it's not using fuel. It's using like the contact of this crystal, like a special crystal. Who knew there's a crystal inside these things? Um, and this uh, voltage, you know, when um, deformed, it really results in electrical discharge, which serves as the ignition. And, um, and then you add, add gas to it, I guess, to when you push it. And so the little hammer goes onto the crystal and then the gas um, goes through the whole thing. And then that's why you have to go click, click, click sometimes um, to make sure that that's actually all the parts are hitting each other and that the gas is actually flowing through there. So, um, you know, even though we use it today for our, uh, you know, our grills and stuff like that, it really did fade out of the mainstream um, during the 1970s. This is something we all have lying around somewhere. Here's one of mine. Um, the Bic Disposable Lighter. So this came out in 1973. And it was really like the intention was to be less expensive than the Zippo. It was really the cheapest lighter on the market. And the Bic Disposable Lighter was really, really popular and definitely still remains popular today. Um, while it really lacks the artistic or fashion appeal of the Zippo, disposable lighters were definitely the perfect um, thing for a fast-moving, money-conscious society as they didn't require refills and could be easily discarded. Now, if you're really environmentally conscious, this really isn't the way to go, but I know we all kind of do our thing, so I'm not telling you what to do. But yes, it could also open up bottles, Nicholas says. <laughs> um so yeah, that was really interesting. Whole lighter history. Um, I had no idea about that stuff, but again, really, really fun to go down a rabbit hole of learning. So let's talk about concentrates. Um, so really, we're going back, back, back. Back, back again. Um, starting with thousands of years ago, the form of concentrate was uh, hashish, uh, which is extracted and compressed. It's an extracted and compressed form of cannabis trichomes. And the trichomes are the resin glands on the cannabis or hemp flower buds, stems, or leaves. And they contain the full spectrum of cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, and other therapeutic compounds. Um, ancient cultures in India, Persia, and China would use hashish for um, medicinal and religious purposes. And um, I started working on the dab history, but before I went into dab history, I had to go into concentrate history to get to dab history. So, um, so you know, hashish really made its way to Europe during the 18th century and was quickly used by pharmacists to make uh, medicinal compounds. Hashish-based medicines quickly became popular throughout Europe and the U.S. during the late 1800s. This guy is definitely enjoying his hashish on his porch or wherever he is. Um, and then cannabis-based tinctures lined the shelves of local apothecaries in the U.S. until prohibition happened. Um, but cannabis concentrates wouldn't see a rise in popularity until the 1940s. You've probably seen a lot of these bottles and 
um, maybe some Google searches, maybe some social media. Um, that's usually what we see when we go back in time to like what cannabis um, was like when it was served publicly. Janelle says she loves hashish. Um, so let's talk about dab history. Dabs, okay? Look at this. Golden, delicious, honey-looking <laughs> material. Um, it was originally created by a chemist named Ronald Stark, and he um, was in a smuggling orga organization known as the Brotherhood of Eternal Love back in the 70s. And they began a uh, pretty small in Afghanistan and slowly became uh, a larger scheme um, when they started working with um, other countries. And they had um, to concentrate the hashish to make it easier to traffic and go undetected. The DEA coined uh, Ronald Stark, seen over here on the right, to be the inventor um, as he was the chief chemist for the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Um, he also did a ton of LSD sales, which has nothing to do with cannabis. However, he, since he was the, the chemist that created um, dabs uh, and that concentrate, um, you know, there's always this connection here between, um, between these kind of things. And so um, Ronald Stark, there he is. So that was a lot of history. Let's talk about today's cannabis accessories. Um, so rolling papers, I, um, when I was picking some pictures, um, and some examples for this, uh, lecture, uh, I like to lean on the feminine side. I am a woman. I like feminine things. Um, that doesn't mean that these are the only things out there, but I really think it's kind of fun to look at like what's, what else is out there instead of kind of like the go-to stoner bro things, which again, there's no problem with those, but, um, but what else is out there? So you can, um, find really, really fun rolling papers and cones and different ways of rolling and don't have to just kind of do the boring white thing unless you don't care about that. And of course that's totally up to you, but, um, I think it's really fun. I found some like really interesting grinders. These are, um, a lot of these are from canastyle.com. Um, and Mary J, uh, Shop Mary J is also an amazing online shop. They also have an in-person shop in Austin, Texas, and they have the most, the coolest accessories you'll ever find. Um, Maureen says, I found rose petal rolling papers. That's so cool. Um, yeah, let me know what other kind of uh, rolling papers you found or what kind of different things, you know, that it's kind of like different than the regular go-to. Um stuff. I really just like the, the feminized things. You can also find them in wood. They're usually metal. Um, and a good grinder will really get your um, cannabis really nice and ground so that you can put it in a bowl or a bong or put it in your joints and um, have a nice smoke. Here's some examples of bongs. Um, these are not your average bongs. This one over here kind of looks more like your average bong in the top left. But um, the can of style came out with a cool disco bong. I'm like, oh, that is so cute. Um, they also have like a pineapple one. My Bud Vase is such a cool company. You should definitely check them out. It's woman owned and um, they have the most amazing bongs and like the cutest stuff to go in there. And a little background actually that I know about Doreen, who's the founder of My Bud Vase. Um, she started my bud vase because she had some people coming over her house and she wanted to hide her bong and she just turned it around and suddenly it looked like a vase. And she was like, that is amazing. <laughs> um, so, you know, I actually have this one, um, this like rainbowy one that was a gift from Doreen and I just really love it. And it makes me feel pretty when I'm smoking. Um, you can also find other ones. This one on the bottom left is actually looks like a crystal ball. They have like a cool, uh, can of style has like a really cool, like witchy, um, Halloween theme. And they have a lot of other cool, fun themes, but, um, you know, smoke up whatever bong is exciting to you. But to me, it's really exciting if you can like show it as art and also smoke weed out of it. Here's some examples of gravity bongs. Um, it, it works kind of how it sounds, although I couldn't tell you how the one on the left works. You have to watch some videos from Grav. Um, but, um, you know, you 
fill it up with water, there's a smoke situation that happens, and then gravity does its thing, and it's just a different way to smoke. If you really want to be entertained in smoke versus kind of doing, um, you know, I'm just going to get high, you know, like if you're going to have an experience, I think that's the fun part of living in, in 2023 and living in the, in the 21st century is that we have this amazing opportunity to next level our cannabis game and our cannabis experience by having cool accessories that, um, you know, that we, that we get and we play with and we invite friends over to try. Um, Candace says bongs that match your personality. Absolutely. Same thing with pipes. Here's some, um, really, really cool pipes. Um, there's like, you can get ones made out of crystal. Most of them are made out of glass. You can also get metal ones. The ones on the right are actually made by a friend of mine. Um, and her business is called Make Good Choices. She makes everything out of hand that's made out of clay. And so um, that one on the top right is a Hitachi. It's meant to look like an old 90s Hitachi vibrator. And it's really funny to smoke out of. <laughs> um, but, you know, like you can have whatever experience you want when it comes to cannabis accessories. And you just have to go, you know, go searching for it. And um, when you find a piece that you really like, grab it. You know, um, a lot of pieces are, you'll never see the same one twice um, unless they're like, manufactured, you know, exactly. But even my bud vase, every single color um, is like slightly different. Every single pattern is slightly different. So find the thing that really matches your personality um, and find a good place to store it. Um, so let's talk about vaping for a, a, a minute. We're not really talking about the history of vaping. However, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, what it is and why it's beneficial. Um, you know, because we, when we, we combust something, we light something on fire, it's the smoke that we're smoking. When we vape something, we're like heating up the element and breathing in the vapor, um, that comes from the heating of it, but we're not burning it. So what are some of the benefits of this? Um, first of all, you reduce toxins, you know, vaporizing heats the cannabis, like I said, without combustion, minimizing the harmful compounds that can come from combustion. Um, it's also a healthier, healthier option. Um, it's gentler on the respiratory system, lowering lung irritation risk. Um, my wife likes to run and literally she's definitely like a daily toker. And yesterday she was just saying to me how um, her lungs are bothering her because she smokes every day. And so when she does that, she usually goes to vaping to kind of just like change the energy of it and um, to change the experience. And that's kind of nice. And some people only vape. They never really do any combusting. And, and it's really up to you how you want to have that experience. Um, you can also really preserve the flavor of something. And I think that's something that really gets lost along the way. When you smoke something, unless you, before you smoke it, you do what's called a dry pull and you like pull on it just to see what it tastes like. I like to do this with joints you pull on it before you light it at all and you can taste what it tastes like, the terpenes, the flavor of it. And you lose a lot of that when you combust, when you smoke it. So you can really preserve flavor by vaping and really enhance your experience with strain flavors and also aromas. Also with vaping, a lot of times you're able to control the temperature on some level. Some vaping devices allow you to do that more than others. Um, but really you can get more precise cannabinoid and terpene activation through there. And it really does, um, it's more efficient and can extract more cannabinoids, really optimizing the plant use. So sometimes when I use, um, a flower vaporizer and I'll show you one that I like, um, it heats the cannabis around it. I'm able to kind of consume there, get a little stone from that experience. I can also then use that product cause it's not burned. Um, to make edibles. So you can kind of use it more than once, which is really cool. Um, Maureen says vape cartridges have many possible contaminants. Oh, interesting. Rosin vape carts are the cleanest and tabletop vaporizers without chemicals. Yeah, we're going to be talking about that. And, that, and thank you for that um, a really important point. Um, with vaping, you can also get more consistent experience. They offer really a steady vapor quality really ensuring a more controlled outcome. 
Um, they also have like rapid effects. They can really enter the bloodstream faster sometimes. Um, although consuming um, joints, you know, I don't know how fast. We should have like a little race to see who gets high <laughs> the fastest. Um, that's really interesting. Um, they can also be discreet. Uh, vaporizers produce minimal odor and vapor, so they're really ideal for discrete consumption. Some people kind of bring them and they consume outside or they'll consume at a concert or something, and it doesn't smell like you're smoking a joint. It just smells like you're smoking cannabis that doesn't smell as much. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Um, there's really less waste because um, vaporization um, extracts more compounds, again, reducing material loss compared to smoking. Medicinal use, it's controlled dosing and potential therapeutic benefits, making vaporizing um, or vaporization flavored among, uh, favored among medical users. And last but not least, preserving the compounds, um, vaporization safeguards cannabinoids and terpenes for a more potent experience. So lots of benefits to vaping. And, um, and that also includes the, the temperature control. So the temperature is actually crucial to the vaping experience. The temperature directly impacts the amount of vapor which is produced. So if you want to minimize vapor, um, stick with a lower range of temperatures if you're able to control it. And if you want a larger vapor cloud, um, you can turn up the heat. And I remember testing, um, which I'll show you actually one of the products that I was uh, a, a, a beta tester on before it really even came out. And I was like smoking it and smoking it. And it was a vaporizer. Um, or the, it was, I was vaping uh, flour actually, and I, nothing came out. And I thought I wasn't getting high because the cloud of smoke wasn't showing, but I found out to be very high indeed. And that I didn't need a plume of smoke to make sure that I was high. But I think because we're used to that, we want to see that. So that's kind of part of that experience. Um, lower temperatures also help you preserve your materials, ensuring that the vapor is rich and flavorful. Um, and really, like we said before, um, like I said before, supporting more discrete experience by decreasing the smell and generating small amounts of vapor clouds. Um, and high temperatures... Um, really, like I said, support vapor clouds, but really also can result in bitterness. So if you want it to taste good and you don't care about the plume, you know, use a lower temperature. So here are some ways to vape. Um, a lot of folks and dispensaries will sell vape pens as is. Sometimes they sell things with cartridges that you can replace. Um, I'm going to be talking about the PAX because that's actually one that I have, the PAX 3. Um, which is the one, the fourth one in, um, in a moment, but these are just some ways that you can, um, that you can vape. So a little bit about dabbing, um, dabbing is heating up this, uh, is heating up a surface, usually a quartz or a metal nail, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment, if you haven't used one, or if you don't know what it looks like, but, um, it's a very high temperature, usually between 600 and 710 degrees. And dabbing is dabbing a small amount of cannabis concentrate on the nail or on the, the head of it so that it evaporates into a gas. And um, cannabis extracts um, are usually containing much higher THC concentrate. So this is really if you want to experiment with higher THC, you might be a medical patient, maybe you have a high tolerance uh, maybe you would just get kind of zonked, <laughs> whatever your reasons for consuming higher, uh, THC, totally up to you, your body, your choice. Um, but that's really what dabbing is really all about. And so what you need is a dab rig or an end with a nail. I have a small version of this. They look kind of like this, although this is more like a more feminized version of it. And that nail part is really that circle part right there where that um, person is putting that dab of golden delicious um, concentrates, um, a dabber, um, a torch. And this is where, this is where I have a personal preference on not going down torch road. Although lots of people love this whole experience. I just think it's kind of like, feels dangerous to me, but it's just, you know, no judgment on anybody that does it. It's just for me, there's other ways to do it. And I'm going to show you a couple of easier ways to um, to, to dab concentrates without having to have like an open flame, etc. Um, but yeah, it definitely is, uh, multiple accessories all at one time, a carb cap to cover the top, 
um, of it and then a dab mat to like put your things on. So this is a whole thing. This is definitely a whole culture and some people only dab and they don't do anything else other than that. These are some um, electric smart e-rig dab vaporizers for concentrates. Puffco makes one. I'm sure there's a ton of them out there, but I'm just most familiar with the Puffco. Um, and so this is like way less scary than an open flame, in my opinion. Um, and this one in the middle is actually made by Puffco as well. It looks like actually like an old school pipe, but you can put concentrates in it. And it like vibrates and lights up when it's time to smoke it and you can kind of consume. You don't have to worry about putting down a flame or something incredibly hot. You can, they actually make carrying cases for these you can bring with you to your friend's house. Um, oh, I forgot to talk about this. There's also electronic vaporizers for flour. And so on the right hand side, this is a volcano. Um, and so what you do is um, it like heats up the, uh, the air around the cannabis flour and then it puts it into a plastic bag. I actually smoked one of these in Amsterdam once um, and it was really kind of fun. So I wanted to talk about the PAX 3. Um, and, um, cause I have this one, I literally have this one in, in this color. And so what's really fun about the PAX three is that you can put, um, flour or concentrates in here. And there is four main temperatures. There's a 360 degree temperature, 380, 400, and 420. And you literally change the temperature by touching the top and it goes through the whole thing. I would recommend if you're going to do the concentrates to clean it immediately afterwards. I definitely did not. And it was such a pain in the butt to like try to clean it um, like days slash weeks afterwards. And then as I was trying to use it again. So it also does come with a couple little tiny pieces. So you want to make sure that you always put it away um, if you do get one of these and make sure that you have a whole ritual around cleaning it and putting it away. But it's very easy to use and I love it so much. And it's sexy looking too. Um, this is actually new on the market. I met um, I met the founder. I actually did an article in Sweet Jane Magazine on her and this whole experience. She's an inventor. She actually has two main products and the billow is one of her um, second inventions. And uh, Candace says she saw that MJ BizCon. Yeah, that's exactly where I found her. And it's really interesting because what it is, it's a flower vape and sesh friendly filtration system. So if you are living in a place where you have someone else in your home or around your home that doesn't consume, that doesn't want to smell it, maybe you live in an apartment um, and you shouldn't really be smoking in there, but you really want to. Um, this actually lets you smoke your joint or your pipe. There's a, this one in the picture is a joint as an example, but lets you smoke and also immediately evaporates uh, or, suck, or vacuums the air <laughs> that you blow out of it. So what she's doing, she's already consumed a little bit and she's blowing it back into the circle piece and it is um, vacuuming <laughs> the smoke. It's really, really fascinating. Um, Janelle says she has one. How cool. Um, it also allows you, um, not only does it vacuum out the smoke, but it, when it does blow any other air, that little compartment piece is actually a filter and you can put, um, good smelling material in there. So it actually almost becomes potpourri for your room, which is really, really cool. And I love this invention so much. I'm excited to see where, um, where it goes. We talked a little bit about um, dab rigs. Here's a couple of examples of that. Remember that torch I was talking about? That's how that's done. It, you heat the glass, you put the concentrate in. Um, this is like a whole dab tool. I don't know what you'd call it. <laughs> Accessory kit, if you will. Again, it's a whole thing. Go watch some videos on that if you're super curious. Um, okay. So... Um, we're really getting to the end here, which is exciting. Um, and I wanted to share a couple more things with you. One of these things is a lighter alternative. It's called the Neo. This is actually a thing I was just talking about um, a few minutes ago that I tried as a beta tester. And so I've seen it in a lot of iterations. This was actually created by a rocket scientist. 
um, named Mark, um, who lives here in Portland and I've met personally and is a friend of mine. Um, and what's really cool is it, it's, it's a lighter alternative. And so they have their own bowl that you can buy, or they have, you can put this on any bowl and they've got like little, a little piece just in case it doesn't quite match or whatever. Basically it heats up the cannabis, the flower around it in a really even way and you consume it and it doesn't burn like it does with a butane lighter. So it is really cool. And, um, I love it so much. I have actually two iterations of this. I don't have the newest, newest version, but, um, this is really, really cool. It's a butane free replacement for your pocket lighter. And, um, it really does, um, extract the compounds from your herb without having ash or any toxic elements that make you cough or smell kind of skunky. I don't know if anybody uses these out there, but um, hemp wick, you can light, if you don't want the butane, you don't want to like consume the butane, you can um, light the end of a hemp wick and use the hemp wick to light your bowl or your bong, et cetera. This is something that um, <laughs> when we had uh, parties a few years ago, we got a ton of these and I still have a, a bunch of them. My, this is something my wife uses every day to light her bong and um, she absolutely loves it. I've also seen people use business cards um, and have like a hemp wick attached to it. I don't know how they do that, but it's really, really cool. Um, this has nothing to do necessarily with a combustion or heating any air around it. But however, um, oil infusers, um, well, I guess it is actually heating air. What am I talking about? These are little mini ovens. Um, this is a Levo on the left-hand side, a uh, woman-owned company. And on the right-hand side is Ardent. And this is a black woman-owned company. It's also the same company um, that it created Billow. And um, if you were edibles, uh, edibles lover, you want to make stuff at home, but you're like, oh my God, it's going to take hours and it's really overwhelming. These two companies really have done an amazing job teaching folks how to use their tools and pressing buttons. And then magically you have an oil that you can make. Um, this one on the right hand side, you can actually bake inside of it. Um, the founder made like muffins or cupcakes for our interview and showed me like she, how, how she did it. And I was like, that is so incredible. So, um, another way of heating up your cannabis and using it to consume, this is an amazing cannabis accessory. And uh, Candace says they also keep the, the smell down too. Yeah. Um, here's some examples of fun rolling trays and ashtrays. You know, you don't have to necessarily have like a boring clear glass ashtray or whatever. You can find some fun ones. I love this one. That's the high priestess card, tar tarot deck card. That's um, from Canna style. Her highness makes like a really cool lip um, uh, ashtray. And of course, there's a ton of rolling trays out there, which are really, really cool. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Mary J, if you're in Austin, Texas, if you ever visit there, you definitely have to go visit um, Shop Mary J. It is Latina owned, family owned, queer owned, and they have the, the coolest stuff. And they don't always have all of their accessories on their website, but they do sell a ton of things there. And you should definitely um, check it out. So if you've got your cannabis and you're like, oh my God, where am I going to put it? Lots of us just put it in a shoebox or whatever kind of like random ass bag we found or got for free at a cannabis event. But there's actually really, really nice stuff out there. And this is like only 0.001% of what um, possibly you could put your cannabis in. Apothecary, which is a black woman owned uh, company based in California. They actually make some really cool... Um, things. That's the one in the center and the one at the top, right? Um, and, um, you know, you can get cute bags. They actually make really cute bags. You can bring them around. So it doesn't look like you're carrying around like a dirty weed thing. It can be really cute. Um, they also have things that, that lock. So if you have children, uh, or teenagers <laughs> trying to find your stash, you can lock these and, um, and that's really, really a cool feature. Um, here are some tools. Um, I'm sure this is very much a, a 
non-exhaustive list of all the tools out there, but this one in the po uh, top left is called the Nug tool. I actually have a few, and uh, about five years ago, I was invited into one of their advertising campaigns just to take some pictures using it and laughing with weed and stuff like that it was really, really fun. But it is like a Swiss army knife for cannabis and folks who dab, they have like one that is more cannabis uh, flower leaning. They have one that's more dab leaning. It's got all the little things and you're always trying to like look for your pokey and you end up finding a pen or a toothpick or some random piece of paper or whatever, but you can have like cute things. Um, this thing on the bottom, you can um, hold, put joints in and put it in your pocket. Um, many different companies make stuff like this. This one's made out of wood. Um, there's little cute things that hold your joints that are like little roach clips that look like, look like little rings and you just put like your joint in there and it's super, super cute. Um, you have cute stash jars. You know, you don't have to necessarily just put it in like a weird baggie, like you said, like, um, or like I said, uh, or like we've done <laughs> probably for many, many years. Um, and there's also like little chillums that can also fill with weed for, uh, when you're going out to your concert or you're going out for the night or whatever, you can pre-fill it and have it ready for you. And it just immediately turns into like a little pipe, which is cute. Cannabolish also makes a um, spray. I'm sure there's lots of sprays up out there, but this is actually like an odor removing spray um, that actually works pretty well. And I'll show you um, uh, High Society Collection in a moment, but they also make really cute joint holders. And again, if you're, if you're looking to up your experience um, and make it less boring, this is the kind of stuff that I would try to get my hands on. So here's High Society Collection. Um, and these earrings are actually roach clips. I'm wearing a pair today. Let's see if we can show you. Um, and so it is, it looks like an earring, but I can take this off and then this becomes a roach clip, which is really, really fun. And I can move this down and it will hold my joints, <laughs> but nobody would ever know that this was a roach clip and it looks really cute. So they actually look like this. I have the purple version. And I love it so much. They also make necklaces. And um, she's also based here in Portland, Oregon. And um, I just love her stuff so much. You also see the joint holder there, which is really cute and sexy. And they make all kinds of, and she makes all kinds of cutesy things. She makes all of these things by hand. They are not manufactured by anybody else. So, um, yeah. And you can hold your joint in your ear until you're ready to smoke it, I guess. <laughs> so... That is it. That's all I have for you today. It's been such a fun time, a huge pleasure to um, walk through cannabis history and um, cannabis accessories with you. Here's all the ways you can find me and LinkedIn and Instagram and all that jazz. So thank you. I appreciate you so much. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. This has been a great, this has been so informative and you've been, um, so funny and so uh, entertaining. Uh, I've really loved your presentation. I've just been learning so many new things and you've been making me laugh. I think one of my favorite things is when you said that we can use business cards to light bowls. And I'm like, I've got a bunch of business cards that I could definitely light on fire. So <laughs> <laughs> I was just laughing. I was like, that is definitely a second use for some of these. So <laughs> um, this has been great. Um, so if you have just a couple minutes for a couple questions. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So if you don't mind, what was the first device um, that you ever used to smoke? If you can think back then. Yeah, well, I'll share a little bit about that. There was like twofold. One, um, going back in time, I was 14 years old. I was like in the woods with two of my guy friends. And I think we actually had a regular bowl. What it looked like, I don't remember. But I think I think it was glass. Um, I don't remember actually getting high. I think a lot of people might say that, like, I don't remember getting high the first time. I don't know what up with that. But um, I would say, like, the next one in line that I actually, like, manufactured, which we can all probably relate to, was a Coke can where you, like, poked holes in the top yeah. and, <laughs> and smoked it. And <laughs> so those are my first two experiences. What about you? Yeah, I would say the same thing. I think it was like ha hiding out like in, the, in a playground, which is like horrible nowadays, um, smoking out of a tin can. 
And I think the second one was, I think that we probably tried to make something at an art class in school, which is again, like horrible. <laughs> now being like an adult, I'm like, what were we doing as children? Um, but yeah, you know, those two very typical things, you know, that young children or young teenagers try to do, you know, Coke can, ceramic kind of pipes. Um, quite another question, if you were stranded on a desert island and you had to pick three cannabis smoking devices, what would they be? Mm. Or accessory and device or devices, you know, some, some of the items that you talked about, three things, what would they be? Okay, well, I need to be strategic. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would, I would bring up Chillum, not because I like, oh, I love Chillums and I have a favorite Chillum, just because it's small mm -hmm. and I can like put it in my pocket. Um, I would probably get one of those, um, <laughs> Gosh, I forget how to like say it exactly, but it's like, um, uh, you know, like where you can you can crash the the thing together and it makes the a breaking spark. device. Yes, um, and because then I can make fires and I can mm -hmm. also smoke my weed. And um, hmm, I don't know what a third one would be. I have to think about the third one. What about you? I would probably want like same thing like a striking device, a bong, and a puff coat. <laughs> a puffco, <laughs> a puffco that maybe you can put like uh, connect to like a solar panel or something. Yeah, it's electric. <laughs> yeah, like I would have to have everything that goes along with it. Of course, like the island would have to have like a way to grow cannabis. I would have to have everything else. But if I only had to pick like three like cannabis devices or accessories, like those would be like you know that was all I could have. Like those three would keep me happy forever. <laughs> yeah, and I guess like since you wouldn't have any cannabis stores necessarily on the island, um, if you wanted to make your own concentrate, as I understand it, you could do like a press. And you can and and let's just say you had access to cannabis flower, press it into a press where you can get that concentrate directly from yeah. there. Um, yeah, assuming you have everything that you need and all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's well, great. What was the answer to the poll? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So going back to the poll, and we were asking everybody, um, what's your favorite type of cannabis accessory? Um, bongs won with 60%. Uh, um, coming in number two was the old school pipe, which, you know, is still something that I roll around with as well. You know, I don't go anywhere with uh, without my cannabis. Um, and another uh, accessory that I love as well is, is the, um, the smell-proof cannabis little pouch, you know, as a woman, I love something pretty and smell proof so that when I'm, you know, out and about, you know, I'm not turning heads, like, where's that smell coming from, you know, so it definitely um, something else that's really important. And I love, you know, how far we've come and how now you can have something personalized or something that kind of matches your personality. There's so many, you know, different styles, you know, and you can find something that really suits you. Um, this has just been um, so great and so informative. Um, thank you for including all your contact information. Do you have anything coming up with Tokativity? Something that, you know, people watching can get involved in or um, anything like the local chapters have going on and like how people can find out about that? Yeah, actually we do. We're just um, finishing this up. And I know this it's going to be recorded. So by the time you watch this, um, you know, whether you're watching it later or whatnot, of course, you can find out everything you need to know on our website, tokativity.com. We have an app, um, but we actually oh, cool. have an event coming up in San Diego, um, October 21st, which we haven't announced yet, but so you're the first to find out. About oh, cool. it. Um, I also, fingers crossed, I'm going to be doing an event in New York City on October 28th. And, um, yeah, we're excited to, to meet everybody. You know, we're still doing some like pandemic recovery and just sort of like one by one, just kind of getting out there wherever we can to connect with our community. And uh, we'd love to meet you. Yeah. And what's the app? How do people find out about the app that you guys have? Um, it is on the uh, Apple Store and fingers crossed should be on the android store i don't know android's been a little bit wishy-washy with their cannabis stuff but yeah. um if you go to our website tokyo.com the links to both of those are on the website um you want you may also be prompted to download it if you have an iphone oh that's so cool 
Well, yeah. wonderful. Unfortunately, I'm one of those an, uh, Android people, so I might have to wait a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> but I will definitely be checking that out because I really, really love what you guys do. Um, and thank you for putting all this information together. It's been so um, interesting and informative. I've learned a great deal of things that um, I can't wait to share with other people. And um, I'm definitely going to go and uh, check out some of those cool accessories that you mentioned and probably make a cool, a couple additional purchases and add to my collection. I've got a glass case at home where I have some of the things I've collected over the years. You know, I've got some money invested in some pieces that I've had for a while. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful that you spent the time putting this together and that you're here with us today. Thank you again for this really informative presentation. You are super welcome. Thanks everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you later. Yeah, and then we're going to have you back again and we're going to have a couple more um, very informative presentations. So everybody, you know, um, look out for those presentations and thank you again for spending some time with us. Thank you again, Lisa, for putting this together. Um, we hope that we were able to share some information with all of you that will help you become better informed cannabis consumers and then if the information that we shared will help you find relief. Stay well, and we hope to see you for another episode of the Friends of the Farm Lecture Series.